Can we figure out how to be more bold and daring in this world with our faith? That's what we're going to talk about today. Too many Christians are more concerned with God's kingdom to come than they are about the one that's here right now. Why are we so concerned about what Satan is going to do in the end times? We should be thinking about what God is going to do through us. If we would just lose ourselves in his kingdom's purpose, we could change the world. James Robinson, that quote comes from the book that we're going to talk about today called A Daring Faith in a Cowardly World. Live a life without waste, regret, or anything unfinished by Ken Harrison. Ken Harrison is the chairman and CEO of The Promise Keepers. He had another career that he was ready to retire from. He was ready to be done. He was going to go live his life and be with his family. And suddenly he got convicted that his life was not over, that he had more to do in the service of Christianity and faith. And so he ended up taking on this challenge. I lived a very upset life in my zero to 25, you know, that my family situation wasn't great. I didn't have a lot of comfort. I lived, you know, uncertainty with what my parents were going to do or what was going to happen. In my 30s, life got more comfortable for me. You know, I started to get a better job. I got a house. And it feels nice and tidy. And sometimes it becomes harder, I think, at that point to be daring. We have things to lose now. You know, I think that in general, I was a more daring person when I had nothing to lose. What can we do to be more bold? You know, we can get challenges to our faith at work. Like I've said before, I worked at a company where the boss wouldn't let us have Bible studies in the lunchroom because she said so. I worked at another company where the boss said very disparaging things about Christianity. What do you do in that face? Do you stand up to him and maybe potentially lose your job or have him lose respect for you now he knows you're a Christian? Is there a way we can live out that faith and be more bold? In the end, what the point of the book is, what's the point of all of this? He thought that the point is that we're supposed to die of self-giving, you know, that we're going to give to the poor and stand up for justice, no matter what it costs. I always have that image of me too, you know, like if I ever got like a sword put to my throat and saying, you know, deny Christ, I'm not going to. But is it quite that simple? Because aren't those things more easy on a day-to-day basis? The boss who says a disparaging thing about God, the date that you might have, where the guy isn't a Christian and you think, well, I'm not really going to talk about it now. All the little places where we lack courage. It's all the little nickel and diming where we just don't live up. It's being saved and having our salvation is great. And it is wonderful. We're all going to meet in heaven. But he says that is when our, our challenge starts, our demand starts. God called us to do things to follow him to the cross, to have righteousness. And he says even sometimes God puts demands in us that seem impossible. And we see that with Jesus too, that he says in this book that, you know, Jesus told Nicodemus all that he had to do to be saved. He told the rich ruler to give away his money. He told that one guy, follow me, but you're just not going to have a house. He told the guy who wanted to go bury his father, no, you come now. All these things were hard on those people that in each of those cases, the people walked away for at least a little while. Nicodemus came back and buried Christ. But he says that the point of all of this is not that we're all going to heaven and going to high five each other when we're in heaven. We're all going to do that. If that was the case, why did Paul do all those things? Why did he travel everywhere? Why did he get into shipwrecks and get beaten and get imprisoned? He was just going to go to heaven. He didn't have to do any of that. He could have gone back to his little house in Tarsus and raised up carrots and it would be fine. Why did all these people who are, you know, martyrs or people who died in the faith, he mentions Mother Teresa and Thomas Aquinas and Luther all suffer for the gospel when all we had to do was just like go home and eat salads and just wait for our time to come to an end. That's what we have to do is that we're challenged actually to now follow in Christ's footsteps that are becoming a Christian is when it all starts. 
And so he says that he wrote this book to really encourage us to go that extra step. And he says that we live a polite American life. And it's true. I think of myself as a very polite American Christian. And I see people, even on Twitter, who I find not so polite, not so kind, not so caring about other people. But instead, that's not what God has called us to do. Not to be mean to people. I'm not saying to be mean to people, but he has called us. He said to have, quote, Christian life has been a duty without passion, resisting sin without hatred of it, so performing works without love. I was not overcome with gratitude that Jesus was crucified because of my sin. Therefore, I didn't cry out daily, Father, let your will on earth be done as it is in heaven. I was a nice Christian. And nice Christians don't get rewards in heaven because they don't win any battles. They don't win any battles because they aren't even fighting. And so he says he answered his own question. He thought about his own life and all the times that he read the scriptures and and did, you know, what he thought was living a good Christian American life. And instead, he said, that is not what, you know, we were created to do. So he reads on with um, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his creations, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. Why were we created? For good works. And so, I mean, there it says right there, we were created to have good works, not because it leads to our salvation, but because it comes after our salvation and before we're dead. So we have those two time points, right? And now we're supposed to be doing these good works, which is strangely enough what I was just getting done talking about when I was in Romans, that we do good works, not because it saves us, but because we've been called to do them. He says, most people won't even figure out what God's plan is for themselves, that they're not going to take that narrow, hard work. They're not going to suffer. They're not going to risk criticism. They're not going to live in a way that is is out of God's will. Instead, we're going to, and this is me right here, run after security, pleasure, and comfort. I don't care about pleasure so much, but comfort and security, I'm all that. I didn't have those things as a kid, and now that I have them, hold on to them very tightly and dearly. I have built my whole life to gain those two things that I didn't have as a kid. Doing that and running to those things, we're not living out God's plan. I don't want to make it sound as dire as that because when we live out God's plan, you know what we get? The richness and rewards, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, of God's plan for us. This is joy. This is going to be amazing. And we're not getting that amazing thing because, like me, running for security, pleasure, and comfort. And he said that, you know, we see it, we saw it in Matthew when I when I went through in the Bible in small steps in Matthew, that we're rewarded for humility, perseverance, uh, lack of pride, forgiveness, mercy, love, all those things are rewarding. And if we don't go out on a ledge and do those things, we don't get that reward either. The Bible or the Beatitudes called them blessed, but it also means the happiest you could ever be, the ultimate happiness. And if you're not those things, you don't get those things either. And so he said that's in the end what he wants people to do, to have a daring faith so that we can receive these amazing rewards. And that this message, he says, isn't so that we'll do more things, but so that is that we fall in love with Jesus. That's so great. Because, quote, the difficulty or delight of living the life God called us to is in direct proportion to how much we love him. We're not doing this for our salvation. We're doing this because we love God. I said that um, before, that Paul was talking about works, not because it forgives us, because we love. One of the commentaries in Romans was talking about that if we got married and we said, I love you, husband. And then we treated our husband poorly every day. Where's that love showing through? Or even worse, we just ignore him. Love you, husband. This wedding is fantastic. I love you more than anything. And then you went on to completely ignore him. Live as you did when you were single. You would actually then start to say, well, do you love your husband? That's the thing here. We say we love Christ. We say we love God. But then when our lives are completely unchanged, it makes you wonder whether or not that's true. And so he says, again, this isn't about backslapping ourselves. This isn't about being judgmental to anyone else. 
He said that sometimes when we congratulate each other, it's one pig in the slop congratulating itself on being cleaner than the other pigs. We're not about that either. So we're not trying to do this so that we can say, look at me, I'm pretty amazing. But God told us that when we do these things, we are going to get blessings. He says that, you know, Christ in the end will still bless us if we don't do these things, but you miss the full blessing, the full piece of it. And so he wants us to live that daring life. He says, unfortunately, you know, we've been taught, he calls a weak and feckless Jesus who runs a weak and feckless religion that God comes to earth. He's a lamb that's slaughtered and now he's a victorious king. Judgment is handed out to believers and un- and to unbelievers and to believers, we see a different throne. We get to a different place. But he says that there's more there that we'll look at when the Bible in small steps, when we get to 2 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians, is that there's rewards, that there's crowns in heaven. And in some cases, that we may even see consequences for our wasted life, that we always have to remember Satan doesn't want us to do things, that he's prowling around and saying, hey, you know what? There's a really good show on Netflix. You might want to watch that. That we're easily, if we can't be ripped away from Jesus, can Satan at least plant our butts on the couch and make us do nothing, right? If you can't make us lose our faith in God, he's going to make us completely ineffectual. He says, quote, Jesus did it all not to get you to the end, but get you to the beginning. You were dead. And now, if you put your faith in Christ, you are alive. You are born again. You are a baby who must grow into an adult. And as an adult, he has work for you to do. Like I said, this book was something else. And I love that enthusiasm that he has for the whole piece. And he says, quote, make no mistake about it. We will be rewarded for completing tasks God gave us at the beginning of creation. And we'll suffer for the ones we didn't. Tough uh, talk indeed. So he says that it's commanded in the Bible that we shouldn't be afraid. And I I think that's at the heart of it. I know for myself, I'm like, I tidied my whole life up. My whole life was a big old mess. And now it's all tidy, organized, secure, happy, comfortable. I did that. I made that that way. But if I step out, if I do something, if I say something, now I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to lose all this. And he's saying that God said not to be afraid. It was the thing he commanded us most to do. Told us so many ways not to be afraid. And we are afraid. We are afraid to step away, to say something against somebody else, or to do something that's frightening to us, or to challenge someone who, like the owner of my company, who said something very disparaging about Jesus. We're scared to do that. He said that the COVID really revealed a lot about humanity where churches closed their doors to everybody. And because we're afraid of dying, we're afraid of getting sick. And instead, we should be a church of boldness. This is where we hold up and help other people. Restaurants were open, churches were closed. Target was open, Walmart was open, churches were closed. I think about like um, books I read about the plagues that happened in times that there were priests and abbots and monks who treated people who had the plague and died themselves of it. They weren't spared from it, but they felt serving Christ was more important in healing people and caring for the poor, the sick, the hungry, and all those things than living their own lives. I mean, he didn't say that in the book, but that's what made me think of it. We're closing our churches because we don't want to get sick. Where are we for the other people, right? Where are we helping everybody else? So he says that our faith should be in opposition to fear, that we should not hold back of our lives because we're afraid of what's going to happen next. In fact, God says we are going to live life fully. And so this is where he says we have to fix our eyes on him, walk that narrow path and go for it. We shouldn't be a hostage to fear anymore. He says, quote, are are the things you are living for worth Christ dying for? Fear says no. Faith says no. Absolutely. And he says that Jesus told all his apostles that they're no longer slaves. And then you think, well, what are we slaves to? I mean, none of the apostles were slaves. They were all free men. But what they were slaves to is they were slaves to their fears. They were slaves to their old faith. They were slaves to their daily drone, you know, 
poor Peter there, he's a slave to fishing because he needed to get more fish to pay for everything. No longer slaves. That we should be trusting in God so much, living so close to him that the fear can't even get in between us. And that we're also called to hate sin, that we're no longer supposed to be slaves to sin. That's really the big thing that we are free as slaves from, that we're called to be holy. And our culture around us doesn't want us to be holy, doesn't want us to love God, doesn't really want us to love everyone. Instead, we see narcissism. Well, what's God going to do for me? We see his love for us as making, well, God thinks I'm doing a great job here. He has rewarded me with this fantastic house. Or that we don't even regard God at all in the lies. I mean, we see that in our culture today. Nobody cares what God thinks in our culture today. And in fact, half the time, if you say God does care about our culture and about us and about what we think, you know, you're laughed out of places. We live in a time where sin has just taken over. We should live our best life, even if our best life is sin. We should do the things we want to do, even if our things that we want to do are hurting other people. He says sin just rots us. It erodes everything. And we have to flee from sin at every moment. He said that we're constantly living that same question of Cain killing Abel. Cain had a choice and he picked anger and bitterness and everything instead of going the way God wanted him to go, which was to live with his brother. We don't know what went on between Cain and Abel, but Cain was clearly jealous, clearly angry, and sin is crouching, it says. And Cain felt that way. God did not want him to go down that path to killing Abel. Abel, probably in heaven. Not, say, not saying that, you know, Cain's sin was any less, but Cain went the wrong way, and we have to fight sin at every chance we can to get away from it. And he says that the Sermon on the Mount was about how someone who is already a believer becomes holy. It wasn't about faith. All those things that he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are all the blessed, right? They weren't about how to gain salvation. They were how to gain blessedness, how to gain that happiness that is the ultimate happiness. And they were talking about how we should live and what we should do and how we can compose ourselves or how we should act towards other people. That was what the Sermon on the Mount was talking about. And he says that much of that sermon, he says, is a stumbling block to all sorts of things that we can, you know, skip over everything that Jesus said. We can put a nice spin on it, that we can go to church every Sunday and do the thing we're supposed to do and, and worship with the sermon musicians. And that's all we have to really do. But Christ called us to pick up the cross and follow him to die in ourselves, to, to die to that earthly thing and start following Jesus. Again, not for our salvation, but to live that blessed life. And so that's what we're supposed to do is take that Sermon on the Mount, step-by-step -step process and live the best life we can, not just for now, but for all eternity. And he gives a very nice rundown of the Beatitudes and the entire Sermon on the Mount, which I really liked. I'm not going to go to it here. But this book, challenges us to, to take those words seriously instead of just as something nice that was said on a mountain some time ago. He says, quote, the Sermon on the Mount is our Lord's recipe for losing ourselves in him. And as long as we hold on to the things in our lives that gives us a sense of value apart from him, we can't grow in him to the full extent. He says that when we do all this, there's great promises that he is proud to call our own. And what does it mean? You know, is first of all, we get to become blessed. He says that we should stay salty. What does staying salty does? Salt purifies. Salt removes evil from something. Salt was about preserving it. But if we become lazy, if we give up on our faith, if we don't do the things that we're supposed to do, we've lost our saltiness. We become, he says, tasteless. And it just means that it's going to be hard for us to get it back. And he says it's time for us to start battling back and regain that saltiness. The disciples, fishermen, the zealot means that he was a, a knife man. Uh, we, we talked about those in the Bible in small steps. They were assassins with knives. 
that were su- to supposed to go after Romans. That's who the, these apostles were. Instead, he took these, he calls them a, a muscular band of ruffians, and then he taught them how to be apostles, how to gain holiness, how to seek the kingdom of God. These were blue-collar people without education, and he made regular human beings, regular people, not kings and queens and the lofty Sanhedrin and the scribes and all those things. He took regular people and taught them how they can walk on water, heal the blind, raise someone from the dead. And that is what God is calling us to do, to come back into this holiness, get rid of this outward seeking religion, I'm going to do a podcast about this whole religious word. I've had a number of people come to me and say, oh, religion, yuck. What I seek is a faith with Christ. What is this word religion? It's essentially everything on the outside. But instead, we're going to go after the inside and we're going to raise our levels back to God. How Jesus even said that, you know, that if we lust in our heart, if we have anger in our heart, that's where it goes bad. And we have to fight that inner fight of keeping us on the right path. And he brings up, you know, people who sinned in the Bible, all people who are clearly in heaven, like King David. But he says that when we let sin in our heart, we lose that saltiness and we risk the life at judgment because it will drive a wedge between us and God. And so God moved away from all of that. He talked about relationships, mothers and fathers to children, marriages, bonding to each other. But that is also all an analogy for honoring him. We are his children. And this is about having, he says, a relationship with him, not just being a loose cannon, just living out there thinking about our safety, security, and our comfort of our home. The Old Testament and the New Testament obviously are the same God. God didn't change. God didn't have a cavalier reaction to sin. He doesn't now. But instead, what we have now is this payment, this atonement that Jesus did on the cross to wipe away our sins. Again, a plan that was set out from the very beginning. But we have to realize that apart from that, like we said at the beginning, our salvation is set through Christ, but the rest of our lives, our choices and actions. If we leave behind the things we love, we'll be rewarded in heaven and eternal life. If anyone loves his life, he'll lose it. But anyone who hates this world will keep eternal life. That, that's that striving. You know, if we get attached to the creation, the things that God made instead of the creator himself, we're not following the true faith of this. And made me think too, look at God. Jesus was in heaven, the perfect place, the place we're all trying to go, the place where people who have new, near-death experiences never want to leave. Christ willingly left that place so that he could pay for our sins and do the hard work that it took to earn our salvation. He's asking nothing less of us, right? If we do all these things, we'll get those crowns. We will rule with Christ, it says, that we will not only fight off the temptations of this world, not only fight off the sins of the world, the, you know, the, the things that are attacking us here, but we're going to have feasts and crowns and we're going to go to heaven There's a list of special rewards in heaven for people who do the work of God. I'm not going to go through them all here, but they're huge. But I think it's not just looking at that reward in heaven, but it's looking at that reward now, putting it all out there on the table, serving Christ, living for him, following him. He says that is when we're truly blessed. That is when we're going to have the blessings, not just in heaven to come, which is going to be awesome but right now because we're going to be living the life God had planned for us all along. And in the end, we're going to be daring. We're going to shed the sin. We're going to shed the fear because we're setting our sights on Christ. And we're going to be able to live that life that God has planned for us, which is amazing right now. So my challenge to you is think about that. Where are there places where you have been less than daring, where you lost your courage? Are there ways that you can bring that back? Are there studies in the Bible, prayers you can pray that you can do in order to try to refocus yourself and put your eyes back on Jesus? 
in the course of all of this through the Bible study in this podcast, I realize that if we can't pray, God, send me where you want me to go. Instead, pray to God. Please, God, let me want to live the life you want me to have. Step back that prayer. If you're worried to ask God to send you where he wants you to go, take it a step back and pray that you have the desire to ask for the life that God has promised you. Keep going back and and getting yourselves into the place where you can accept it is that God plans for your own life. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. This, strangely enough, works really well with the Bible study we're doing, the Bible in Small Steps. We're right now on Romans, which is book six. We are cooking along over there. So if you're interested in doing a Bible study, a chapter three times a week, kind of a slow roll through the Bible, and you want to read along with us and then listen to the podcast and get back to me and tell me what you think, please go ahead and start listening. The Bible in Small Steps of the podcast, you can find my name on it. I appreciate you listening. And remember, daring to have the courage Christ asked us to have starts with small steps and big prayers. Mm -hmm.